Good morning, good afternoon and good evening ladies and gentlemen. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the lots of the beautiful Himalayas where the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is located. The think tank was established in the month of February in the year 2016. It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations foreign policy, security studies, and development. NICE has four research centers, China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies, and Security and Strategic Studies. The institute focuses on eight research topics climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, border and transboundary water politics, Indo-Pacific affairs, disaster management and international economy and development. Previously, NICE has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at NICE. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. Well, thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. NICE Global Conclave is a flagship event of Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Engagement. The theme of the three-day conference is Connecting Nepal to the World by bringing leaders, diplomats, business leaders and scholars from all around the globe. The objective of the conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world and at the same time update the Nepalese policy makers and experts about the fast-changing geopolitics which will help Nepal reshape its foreign policy and to achieve its national goal. This is session D of the conference and to chair and moderate this session, it's a real pleasure to have Professor Dr. Michaela Pelican and Dr. Amrita Datta here with us. This session is supported by the Global South Studies Center in the University of Cologne. Dr. Michaela Pelican is a professor of social and cultural anthropology at the University of Cologne. Previously, she was a guest professor at the Graduate School of Asian and African Area Studies at the University of Kyoto, a lecturer at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Zurich, a researcher with the Max Planck Institute of Social Anthropology in Halle, and a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Kent. She received her PhD from the Martin Luther University Halle Wittenberg and MA from the University of Bayreuth. Dr. Amrita Datta is a researcher on transnational migration at the Global South Studies Center, University of Cologne. Earlier, she moderated the web talk series titled Corona Conversations, Mobility in the Post-COVID-19 Future. Without any further ado, I request the chairs to take over. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. My name is Michaela Perlikan and I'm very happy to introduce you to today's panel on impact of the pandemic on transnational migration. This panel is organized together with my colleague, Dr. Amrita Datta. Both of us are also based at the University of Cologne. So I would like to very briefly introduce the three distinguished uh, migration scholars that are part of our panel today and with whom together we are going to have a discussion. So this is not a longer presentations, but rather a discussion round. So the first of the scholars who is joining us for this discussion is Dr. Jonathan Enge. He is a visiting scholar and also a principal investigator in a project on COVID-19 and its impact on African migrants. And he is based as well at the University of Cologne. Our second speaker is Dr. Professor Dr. Habibul Kontker. He is Professor of Sociology at Zaid University in the United Arab Emirates. And our third speaker is hopefully going to be Dr. Ratna Mani Nepal, who is a lecturer of rural development at Tribuan University. 
So far, I haven't seen if he has, uh, when we checked last time, he was not yet here. And I can't see him, but I hope that he will join us in a minute. So all three scholars here are distinguished migration scholars with firsthand experience of working on, migra on migration and specifically on the impact of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic on transnational migration. So I would like to first of all give them a chance to introduce themselves. So each of them has around five minutes to talk about their current research. So we will start with Dr. Jonathan Enge. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, introduction and uh, thanks also to everyone for attending this our uh, panel discussion. Yeah, uh, my background is in sociology and my research generally is on international migration. So initially I started working on South North migration, focusing on the integration of African migrants in Europe, specifically in Sweden. But then later on, after my PhD, I moved on to look at South-South migration. And in the new focus, I looked at migration from West Africa to the Arab Gulf state, and I examined issues of their economic integration. Then more recently, I am working on a project that looks at the, the gender uh, dimension and dynamics of human trafficking in the context of migration from Cameroon to the Arab Gulf state. And within this project, there is a, another project going on, you know, given the new development that happened last year, and I'm talking about the pandemic. So the project is uh, basically we're looking at the impact of the pandemic on African migrants in the United Arab uh, Emirates and in China. In this project, I am collaborating with uh, Professor Michaela Pelican and Professor uh, Tu Hoin. You know, the projects are taking place in the United Arab Emirates and in China. So a parallel project is uh, being uh, handled by the colleague in China right now. Yeah, and in the project, we look at, there are just basic questions that we try to answer. And those questions relate to, you know, uh, for example, how does the pandemic affect the production and reproduction of social inequalities, as well as the emergence of opportunities for vulnerable migrants. So we use this as the entrance, our entry point to the research, and then we explore uh, other uh, issues, you know, which are related to the broader issues. Yeah. And, uh, I look forward to you know discussing more about my research you know as we get uh, more into the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for this uh, kind introduction. Then I would like to ask Professor Habibul Konka to introduce his research and himself. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Good day, and shubhodin to all my friends who are uh, on this panel and watching this panel. Um, I have been uh, doing research uh, on migration uh, in a kind of tangential way. My main interest is in uh, sociological theories, especially the theories of globalization. And when someone looks at globalization, you know, he or she is forced to take migration into account because this is the face of globalization. This is the most tangible visible tactile aspect of globalization that you can see. And before coming to Abu Dhabi at Zayed University, I was teaching for a considerable amount of time at the National University of Singapore. And as you know that Singapore uh, is a major player in, in receiving uh, migrant workers, especially uh, low skill, although I don't like the word, Word low skilled, you know, it's it's a very specific skill that they have, uh, especially construction and so on. So Singapore attracted huge number of migrant workers from India, from Bangladesh, uh, from the region. So I got interested in, in the subject and I supervised a, a thesis on Bangladeshi uh, migrants in in Singapore. And as I moved on uh, and sort of uh, took shelter in Abu Dhabi at Zayed University. This is basically a, a land of migrants, you know, uh, uh, out of population of 
of 9.8 or let's say 10 million, um, 85 percent and some estimates say 88 percent are non-local. So this is a country where the majority of the population can be counted as migrants uh, and we can classify them as high-end expatriate professionals, professors and doctors and engineers and architects at, at one spectrum and uh, workers on the construction site, workers in other areas of uh, UAE economy. Um, and that is a very interesting uh, dynamic. Now, workers all around the world share this experience of vulnerability. So the pandemic induced vulnerability is nothing new. It has simply exacerbated the situation for them. But at the same time, we have to remember they, they're, they're very resilient. You know, they're, they're faced, they've faced all sorts of things. They've seen it everything. So when this pandemic uh, kind of struck, um, I got interested in, in looking at, you know, the plight of the foreign workers, not only in the Gulf, but also in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, where I have friends, I have contacts, I was trying to get information. Um, and I found out, and this is something that I've been interested in for a long time, that in order to understand migrant workers, uh, one of the most important institution is a state. A uh, state not only of the receiving country, but a state of the dispatching country. So where migrants are coming from, you know, look at the state and what sort of governance is available and what sort of governance is taking place in the receiving end. So migration governance has been a subject that I've been interested in. I've written on this. And one of the concepts that, you know, I've been using and maybe others are, is the concept of migration diplomacy, that how nation states get involved in negotiating, you know, uh, you know, to the welfare, to the benefit of migrant workers. And in this situation of COVID, you know, pandemic, uh, I think that migration governance uh, has been extremely important. And just before I end, you know, I mean, if you look at Singapore, you know, Singapore was handling you know pandemic uh, in a in a remarkable way that uh, led to the world health organization uh, president to uh, you know praise singapore and suddenly the migrant workers uh, situations uh, turned the table and they they figured out that there has been a huge outbreak so by april you know the whole scenario changed but the government has been quite effective in dealing with the pandemic among the migrant workers. And I see the similar trend in the UAE, that the government has been very responsive, the community has been very responsive. So as I get my next chance, and I'll be able to elaborate a little bit more on that. But thank you for giving me the opportunity, Michaela. Thank you so much, Habib, for this introduction. And I would also like to mention now already, before I forget, that Habib uh, has together with two colleagues just edited a volume on COVID-19 and governance crisis reveals, which uh, is going to appear or has appeared just now um, in Routledge. So for all of those who are interested in learning more about Habib's work and this specific to, uh, presentation he's going to make or what he's talking about, there's also this book. Um, I would like to find out now if Ratna has joined our meeting. Please, if so, could you um, talk now? I could not see the name in the list. Amrita, have I you don't. No, I don't see him either. Uh, let's let's carry on and let's hope that he joins us uh, sometime soon. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Professor Pelican, for uh, inviting the panelists to introduce themselves and we already know a little bit about the interesting work. Uh, uh, Dr. Enge, uh, let me first ask you, um, uh, could, you could you please tell us a little bit more about your uh, methodology, uh, you know, the kind of like the kind of data that you were uh, aiming to gather, especially from the uh, African migrants in the Arab region in the UAE and the methodology and the kind of uh, techniques and the kind of engagement with the participants, who are your participants? What kind of data is being generated? If you could tell us something from the field work, some reflections. Okay. Um, thank you for that uh, 
question, I mean, the reason the issue of methodology is very important to our research is because it is part of the research. Yeah, of course, we do have uh, questions which are related to the content, and that's what I mentioned earlier, you know, that we try to look at the impact of the pandemic in terms of, uh, in relation to, you know, the opportunities as well as the, some of the challenges that arises because of the pandemic. But one issue which we take very seriously is the way we conduct our research. And so we start from the, our starting point is that research in the social sciences is a collaborative process. You know, it's a collaborative process. And what, they, uh, what this means to us is that we take the issue of inclusion, we take the issue of acknowledgement, we take all of that very important. And we are talking about collaboration, not just between colleagues, you know, because this project is a big project that involves like there are three principal investigators. But then we are looking also, we pay attention to collaboration with the people who are the target of the study. Yeah. And the way we have incorporated them in the research as research collaborators, we've done it in a way that, you know, goes beyond the traditional uh, kind of research, especially in the social sciences and uh, anthropology, you know, where you go to a community and then you spend time with the people, you develop rapport, you get to know them and you conduct your research. Yeah. And uh, in this, in our case, first of all, the study is ethnographic. Yeah. So it's basically a qualitative study and we try to get in-depth information from the community. But of course, we are also interested in some kind of follow-up on you know, secondary data, I don't know, from news sources, government report, and so forth. So we've basically um, uh, 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 recruited specific, you know, like key collaborators from the communities. And with them, we try to get them involved on every level, you know, starting from understanding what the project is because they have a very good knowledge. They've read the research proposal, the full research proposal, understand the research questions and everything. But then together with them, we try to develop, you know, the specific questions which could help us answer the main research questions which we develop when we uh, started the project at the very initial stage of the project. Yeah. And then we also get them involved, not just in data collection, but also at the level of a data uh, uh, um, management and analysis. Yeah. Then we are also hoping to have them to get them involved at the level of, you know, I would not say writing, but also on like dissemination of output like just what we are having so our plan is that uh, in future when we get opportunities to share our result with the public so we would involve the collaborators they would be the one talking i mean we would talk together with them but they would be the one you know like having the lamb like yeah and also we would explore avenues such as uh, writing blogs and whatever available channels which they can put their work out there or at least uh, share the output of our research. So that is the, uh, uh, the general approach which we are using. So this approach, of course, if one has to go back to, I don't know, anthropological knowledge or sociological knowledge, of course, it is referred to as a participatory methodological approach. Yeah. And uh, working with individuals from the target uh, study population as research collaboration on eye level, you know, helps us to get not just trust from the community, but make sure that their voices, they are directly involved in uh, shaping the kind of knowledge that we collect, but also how we represent that knowledge. Yeah, so this is 
I think we believe that this is something which is lacking in the, at least the established approach in qualitative research so far. Yeah. And finally, what I can say uh, in regard to this approach is that the pandemic itself has made it very difficult to go to places and do field work. Yeah, so we also think that it is very timely. And uh, of course, given what is happening and what the new approach which we are trying to use, we hope that it will also uh, open up new avenues, you know, and ways of doing research in future, even after the pandemic. Yeah, at least as far as our own work is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Dr. Amy. Oh, sorry. Yes, please carry on. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for exploring more on the methodology. As you mentioned, I'm also part of the project and I would like, I'm sorry, uh, I would also like to advertise our project a little on uh, what uh, we have in terms of documentation already. So I will paste a link on to the website where you can find more information. And I also paste a link to the recent publication of uh, Professor Kondke. Um, I would like to ask a question in a similar manner to Professor Conker on the methodology, on the research methodology, because I know his work is, well, is sociological work similarly, but it has, since you, as you said, you are focusing also on uh, the question of migration governance and migration diplomacy, your, your approach might be slightly different. So I'm curious to hear how you approached your subject. Thank you, Michaela. Uh, like Jonathan, you know, I, I also do a lot of ethnographic work. Uh, and, and one thing I share with Jonathan that, like Jonathan, I'm also a migrant. So sometimes I present myself, people ask me, who are you? I said, I'm a migrant worker. And they don't accept me. They say, no, you don't look like a migrant worker because you know, in order to be a migrant worker, maybe I'm not strong enough, or I don't know, maybe I'm bald and migrant workers should have hair on their head. I don't know. Um, that is a problem, you know, because sometimes we'd like to pursue ethnographic study, but once I go to them, uh, you know, they don't accept me. There, there's this distinction that, okay, you teach in the university, we work uh, out in the field. So you really need to work through what I call key informants. So I really have some contacts who are not workers per se, but they have good contact with workers. So I usually work through them. But much of the methodological uh, question, question of methodological strategies depend on what you want to do, right? So once I was involved, it's a National Federal Council, Demographic Council of UAE, I was part of the project where we wanted to look at, you know, the role of agents uh, in the a process of labor migration. And Nepal was one of the countries uh, involved in that project. I visited Nepal and I talked to people in Nepal who work with migrant workers, you know, NGOs and university professors and so on. But back in Abu Dhabi, we organized a number of focus group discussions with Nepali workers and we elicited, you know, extracted their experience, you know, what sort of, how much money they had to pay, who did they pay, and so on. And the project was really very pragmatic. You know, this was an IOM project in collaboration with the UE official, you know, sort of authority. And they, they took a very pragmatic standpoint that, look, you cannot wish away the agents. So you, you might as well use them very properly. You might make them accountable rather than ignore them. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. So how could we incorporate, you know, the agents as part of this uh, institutional edifice of uh, migration process? Um, and we had to do that, you know, focus group. Now for my governance project, you know, I, I went to Malaysia, I went to Philippines to spend some time in Philippines. Basically, I talked to officials and they were extremely generous. You know, they invited me in various meetings and briefing sessions in, in Manila. So I could see, you know, what the government officials are doing. I, I carried out research in Bangladesh. Uh, you know, the officials are very helpful and I attended meetings and I talk to them. Um, and then most of the embassies, you know, labor sending countries in UAE 
the embassies have labor attaches. So I work with them. I, I build rapport with them. I actually belong to a number of community organizations, you know, like Bongo Bundu, uh, Memory Organization. You know, there some of them are semi-political, but mostly social organizations. I'm an advisor to a couple of them. Uh, I belong to many of those, you know, sort of organizations uh, to get an entry point into the world of migrants. Because as you realize that when you're living overseas, you know, you're kind of clustered, you know, you are in your own setting with academics and you have no access to the lives of the, you know, working class people and so on. But through these organizations, I've been able to access, you know, uh, what the workers uh, do and where they live. And I have appeared on national TV in Bangladesh on various shows commenting on workers and other things as well, you know, politics and so on. So whenever I go to a restaurant and so on, some of them might recognize me. It's, oh, you're the professor, you know, and that helps me a lot, you know. So they know that I often talk about them and, and so on. So it's an ethnography, as Jonathan said correctly, but ethnography with a twist that you really need to get into the community, get out and you know, be in your classroom and do your own academic research and then uh, do field work. So I find that very interesting. And my own experience as a migrant, so I've also written on so-called diaspora, you know, the diasporic experience. I've lived in Canada, I've lived in US. I spent a lot of time in Singapore and I've traveled around the world. So all those things, and this is a kind of personal experience, a serious, you know, methodology Puritan might dismiss it. No, 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 that's not methods, you know. But to me, that's very serious method. You know, I call it retrospective, you know, sort of experience, experiential method. Uh, we can all bring in that um, and we can add to that, you know, other more officially recognized formal methodology. But those personalized experiences, I think, are very important that meeting a group of Bangladeshi women at the airport in Beirut, I had a wonderful conversation with them and I found things that I would not have found if I had carried out a formal interview session. Uh, on the plane traveling from Dhaka to Abu Dhabi, you often meet people who need your help to fill out their forms. And I, I always volunteer because through volunteering, I can get to know the person. I can find out, you know, wh where is she going? What is it about? So through all these informal, I call them informal methodologies, we enrich our formal methodologies and we need to combine both informal and formal approaches to doing research. Thank you, Michael, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Konkar. Uh, you explained the role of a cultural insider perhaps, or not, or one who can mimic that. Uh, extremely interesting uh, from the perspective of ethnography. As an ethnographer myself, uh, working among the Indian women communities in Germany, I can definitely say that you know uh, self-identification is extremely important to uh, enter the field and uh, remain there uh, to gather data. Uh, let us now moving on to the next segment uh, where we have uh, we would like to you know ask you some uh, specific um, questions. Not like really ask you uh, per se, but you know throw some specific questions uh, to the panel and then you know we can uh, generate a discussion around them. Uh, there are several uh, issues which are uh, very much um, in topic in terms of a pandemic mobility interface right now. Uh, for example, you know the vaccine situation, uh, the transnational future of transnational mobility uh, among, among uh, you know they surface as some of those really important contexts. Um, my uh, first concern um, uh, is that you know the uh, the political economy of the virus has has emerged as a subject where you know the va the vaccine has really become uh, the most crucial issue perhaps uh, in hand for all of us across the world. Now, ranging from discrepancies around the availability of vaccine, their efficacy, information around vaccine availability. So there are several questions, you know, in terms of communicating uh, the information around vaccine to blue collar migrants, citizens, white collar migrants, and so on and so forth. So the discourse of vaccine uh, throws different perspectives uh, at us every day. Now, standing at the crossroads, uh, 
what are the long term implications of the way uh, you know vaccines are rolled out in different countries and how important are vaccines going to be in our everyday lives, especially in the lives of transnational migrants in terms of their mobility? And uh, what happens to those who do not uh, choose to inoculate? Like, does opting out of vaccination process throw us out of an invisible mobility system at some level? So this is uh, th the thought that uh, uh, we could uh, right now uh, grapple with. And I would like to, to, with this question, I would like to first start with Dr. Nge. What is your opinion in this context? OK. Uh, I think the issue of, uh, you know, the rollout of uh, vaccine and even how the management of testing is causing some serious challenges, which you can find in almost every country that is has been affected by the pandemic. But uh, of course, I would like to talk specifically about the United Arab Emirates, where at least one, we have some data on the ground to help us get, I don't know, part of the picture, because I know there is a lot, and uh, Professor Conde probably would also provide more insight, since he is the one who is there right now, but we, are, uh, we have our own set of information. The first thing I would say is, uh, I agree with him earlier, with his earlier statement that the United Arab Emirates, you know, the government has done a lot you know, as far as handling of the pandemic is. So when you look at whether we are talking about testing, we are talking about access to vaccine, what we can say based on our data is that the problem is not about access to vaccine or access to testing. That one is just, it's almost like pretty much everyone, at least majority of the population who want to be tested or want to get a vaccine, they can, you know, they have access to these things. But then when you go deeper, there are other issues which are related to the rollout of the vaccination that might, we think, you know, is reproducing or is making it difficult for some segment of the population, specifically migrant population, to even get access to the very uh, vaccines and testings which is meant to save their lives. And by this, the issue goes to the problem of communication. The Gulf state in general, most of them, these are very centralized government. They have a top-down approach. And the problem with this, as far as the pandemic is concerned is that when it comes to communicating what they are doing to the public, which is very important, especially to the segment of the population who because of their positionality might be very skeptical about whatever the government says. But unfortunately, they are doing very little you know, to communicate what they are doing about the pandemic. And because of that, there is a lot of misinformation and misinformation breeds, I don't know, doubt and lack of trust. And then in the end, we have cases where people are even, you, they turn to rumors, you know, because they can't get certain information and what they get from these unverified sources mostly uh, uh, is information which might even discourage them or tell them like stay away from the vaccine. And uh, uh, the, on the whole, you know, from the start of the pandemic, especially last year, there've been like some state provided economic assistance and it followed a kind of format where in the end, some people where you know receive benefits and others did not and even within the migrant communities yeah and what we try to see is like okay what is causing this variation because our one of our interests of course is to look at the how the pandemic and its management is reproducing uh, uh, unequal power relations and inequalities as well as uh, generating new opportunities. But what we are finding out is that first, in terms of those who benefited, whether we are talking about the economic assistance from the state, 
it has very little to do with, I don't know, class, if one can use that term broadly, because we find out that people who are in the same occupation or similar occupation, some of them, they benefited, whereas others did not. And we see the same thing as far as uh, this uh, information and the problem related to lack of information to the vaccination rollout. We find out that it, the, the group which is mostly um, affected in a negative way, you know, as far as taking the vaccine and, you know, their mobility uh, uh, is, uh, is based on their residential location. And for those of you who might be familiar with uh, the Gulf state or the United Arab Emirates, you would understand that majority of the workers, you know, they live in labor camps. And these labor camps are usually located on the outskirts of the city. Yeah. And the situation of labor camp migrants might differ from those of other migrants who do very similar job, but live in I don't know, live in the city because they are not all labor migrants live in labor camps. Some of them are able to uh, live in private accommodations in the city, which usually are more or less of the same standard, like the labor camp accommodation. But the difference is that labor camp migrants are subjected, and this was even before the pandemic, to some kind of surveillance. You know, their movement was already restricted. So their life generally centered around work and then coming like transportation uh, to and from work and that's it, yeah. So, but then with the pandemic and the extra restrictions that have been put in place, we see that this, the restrictions of their movement is even going, I mean, taking a more stringent, uh, 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 is even more stringent than before. Yeah. So today, most uh, labor migrants, uh, for example, you have extra regulation to these uh, labor uh, migrant camps. Like recently, you find out that even though between the various uh, main cities or the Emirates, there is regulation of movement. You need to be vaccinated or you need to have your um, uh, uh, test, the most recent test in order to cross, move from one Emirates to the other. But then even within the same Emirates, we find out that there are extra regulation for any movement to and back from some of these uh, labor camps. And this is something which I think is very new and our uh, uh, informants, you know, they don't even understand why this is happening. Yeah. And the more they try to get information or an understanding of what is going on, nobody is telling them anything. And they're using very high tech, you know, they scan their eyes, they do, and they, what they are, their conclusion basically is like, okay, maybe this is, there is something hidden. There is something about this, which is really not it's not fair to them. Yeah, it's not, it's, they should be concerned. And presently, what is going on, of course, those of them who try to uh, resist taking the vaccine or doing testing, and it happens to everyone, of course, their movement and access to, I don't know, government buildings, businesses is restricted. Yeah. But then so many of them, on the other hand, are getting vaccinated, they are doing testing, but they are doing so as a last measure because they are always faced with the option where, okay, you either get tested, you either get vaccine, vaccinated, or maybe you would lose your job. I mean, sometimes it's not being said openly to them like that. It's not communicated in such a threatening way, but they are understanding is that if you don't get vaccinated, if you don't do this test, eventually you might lose your job because you would be of no use to the company. Then there, is, there are also issues of uh, unannounced um, testing. 
and vaccination exercises that goes on in the labor camp. And these sometimes happen in the middle of the night. Yeah. But on the other hand, some of the labor camp residents, they feel that these extra measures, you know, somehow is good for them in the sense that most of them feel safer within the labor camp communities because even when they go around to crowded places and people are not putting on their masks or not respecting social distancing they are very sure that most people in the labor camps have been vaccinated or they're subjected to some of this uh, regular testing which is not exactly the case in the city center and other part of the emirates where people you have people i don't know international visitors and the middle class there is a much uh, lax approach at least their basic rights are respected they are not being encroached in that way but the outcome of this is that labor camp migrants they tend to feel a bit safer in their own accommodation and residence and um, uh, yeah so as far as uh, the bottom line is that as far as movement is concerned the having vaccinated or testing i think is already producing this effect of a uh, mobility restriction within you know the country because those who are not vaccinated to move freely is very restricted yeah and by not communicating what the state is doing somehow it doesn't help because it makes people to feel even become more suspicious and by when they are more suspicious some of them you know they are very reluctant to take the vaccine and yeah thank you thank you dr Enge. uh dr konka quickly would you how would you like to respond to uh dr Enge? No, oh, first of all, I would like to say that both Singapore and, and the Gulf states, you know, that I have an interest in, have excellent uh, public health uh, infrastructure. Uh, so this was pre-COVID, pre you know, they always had excellent public health infrastructure and workers, foreign workers were not kept out of that. So every foreign worker in UAE has a medical card, has a health insurance. Every worker has an insurance. So, you know, and once the testing began, it was open to both formal and informal workers, meaning undocumented workers had equal access to testing and vaccination. So I think this is a remarkable, we have to give credit for that. And if you look at the number of vaccination, UAE population is, let's say approximately 10 million, 14.8 million, vaccine doses have been administered. So which comes to 70, 70%, you know, if we divide it by two. Uh, so that, that, that's a significant uh, you know, achievement. And uh, unfortunately, what we see, like some of the stellar performers in con containing COVID in South, in East Asia, Taiwan, you know, Singapore, they were not doing that well in terms of vaccination. Singapore did well, but not Taiwan, not Japan. I mean, that's remarkable. You know, I mean, these countries for some reason. So if we really want to expand the discussion of vaccination and the political economy and the inequity, inequality, disparity at the global level, we also have to look at the governance aspect of it. What kept Japan waiting what kept taiwan waiting of course in the case of taiwan we have geopolitics you know between china and the west and finally us is you know, sending uh, uh, you know vaccines you know johnson's vaccines and so on to the displeasure of the chinese so that that's a big issue there but i i would say that this is a tricky issue you know we talk about freedom liberty i mean look at us you know the states where you have a large percent of people who are vaccine deniers, they are still having the highest rate of uh, infection. So where, where do we draw the line on the question of liberty and freedom to do whatever one, one wants to do? I mean, this, this leads to a philosophical issue and we don't have time for that. So I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Quentin.
Thank you so much to both of you for your very informed um, answers to this, uh, the topic of vaccine rollout. And I just want to add here that, you know, we uh, the same experiences or different kind of uh, experiences are also happening in Germany. So as I think what is important also linking up to what uh, Professor Kornke said earlier, we are all living through it. We are all migrants, most of us, and we are living through it. So we basically all have firsthand experience, you know, of what the vaccine, how this uh, or how the pandemic, um, you know, is developed developing and then also the, the vaccine rollout and this kind of, um, you know, uh, both aspects of governance, but also aspects of how you experience or yourself as a migrant, I'm a migrant myself too, how you experience the access and the information flow and so on. So I think it's something we can all relate to. Um, thank you also, uh, Habib, for taking up the point of um, undocumented migrants, because that was a question that also came from the audience. And you have made it very clear that when we talk about transnational migrants, we mean documented as well as undocumented migrants. So um, there will be, you know, if there are more follow up questions on that, they, they can definitely be asked at the end of the session when we open up for general questions from the audience. I would like to go to the second question that we have um, on, uh, you know, on our mind for this panel, and that uh, relates more to the politics of migration and also changes in the labor market. So what we have seen is that with the pandemic, you know, most of us, at least academics, we are working from home. Um, and so white collar, white collar migrants are basically the ones who have the highest uh, likeliness to be able to work from home. And one of our distinguished co uh, colleagues, Jiang Biao, who is like who is the, the 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 head of one of the sections of the Max Planck Institute uh, for Social Anthropology in in Germany, for example, he commented that immobility now has become a capital, you know, particularly for people who are able to work from home. So my question or our question is basically what what do you think will happen for both? What will what is this? What is going to happen after the pandemic? Also for white collar migrants, but as well um, uh, blue collar migrants. If you know the demand for work has changed now because the the, the labor market is is, is transformed significantly as, as we all have experienced. And what does it mean? Will it be possible basically for people to stay in their home country? and work for remotely, which means that they will no longer have the opportunity to leave because companies might not want them any longer. They might not want to take the responsibility for the person, but simply have the access to the work. So I would like to ask Habib first um, about his, his you know, thoughts and experiences to this question. You, you're absolutely right that there's a divide between you know, the, uh, the so-called white color work and uh, the blue color work. Uh, and, and this whole idea of essential work, you know, suddenly we, we have figured out who are essential. Now, most of us who are in white color work, we are not that essential. Uh, and yet we are the beneficiaries of the system in terms of income and so on. But the irony is those who have been identified as essential workers, say in New York, um, are at the opposite end, you know, in terms of income and benefits. And also it has exposed some of the uh, problems and some of the built-in hypocrisies of the capitalist system, you know. So this, this has been revealed by the, by the pandemic, that people who are engaged in essential work are not benefiting. And, and someone actually said that they don't want clapping, they don't want an airplane, you know, driving, flying by. They want salary increase. They want more benefits. What about that? You know, um, so yeah, these are big, bigger questions. So the future of work, you know, is a very very big issue. And recently, Anthony Giddens gave a talk on that. That the whole work situation is changing, and some of the changes began, you know, before the pandemic. The pandemic has kind of, you know, expedited those uh, changes. Uh, so some of the changes are that many of the professionals can now work in a blended atmosphere. Part of the work they will do from home, part of the work they will do from Starbucks, part of the work they will do from actual office, uh, and that can be done. But you're right that the blue color workers have no choice, that they have to show up for work. The nurses, the cleaning ladies, and the construction workers, they have no choice. So they have to go in. And you can see out of this, we see a lot of solidarity. I just saw this morning in Bangladesh, the media and various groups are pleading with the government that those who are wanting to leave Bangladesh to go overseas for work, please make sure that they get the vaccination. 
because usually in vaccination rollout in countries like Bangladesh or India, the urban groups, you know, they get the, um, you know, first access, you know, they are preferred over the rural population and so on. But there, there's a concerted effort in Bangladesh. And in the past, because of this sort of mobilization, the government was forced to arrange special flights for the returning workers, because many of the workers who went home got stranded and their, their employers were wanting them back because the economy has to keep going and there were no flights. So special flights were arranged uh, you know, with, with uh, the airlines that brought Bangladeshi workers back to Abu Dhabi under direct instruction by the prime minister that no, you have to take them back. But this was possible because the workers and their sympathizers mobilized. So I think this is also an occasion for mobilization that you are absolutely right. The work situation in post pandemic you know, world order would be very different from the one before. Uh, and a lot depends on the ability of workers to mobilize so that they're not left out. That even when they're working you know, in person, uh, that they should get their benefits, they should get everything that is due to them. Uh, now, special problems are faced by domestic workers, and, not, and I'm trying to keep track on domestic workers in Lebanon. Uh, and I find that they're in a very, very difficult situation, but they're sharing uh, this sort of economic crisis uh, with the uh, citizens of the country because the whole economy is in a deep, deep crisis. Um, and we have seen, you know, the fates of the domestic workers, you know, some, were, some of them were discarded, you know, uh, back to their embassies and so on. Um, so those are the things that need to be prevented. And we really need a lot of mobilization, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sharing our, uh, you know, needs and sharing our efforts lot of cooperation because we have to remember that the COVID uh, crisis is a global crisis and the only way out is, is global cooperation between workers and managers and the employers and the countries. So suddenly, you know, the, the age of migration has been replaced by age of immobility. Uh, but I hope that this age of immobility will not be an age but a period of immobility and we'll be back to the age of mobility in the post-COVID world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Habib, for this. I would like to, I have to say, check the time. Um, I have a very small question on what you just said with the, the last part, and that refers to the, 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 the domestic workers in Lebanon, because you said that um, they are sharing the same problem of the economy, the basically a, a very strange economy with the, the non-migrant population. So my question here is when we take the framework of Nina Glegschil and Aisha Chala, who are emphasizing that one should look at the relationship between migrants and non-migrants and not always treat migrants separately from the non-migrant the, you know, non population. Do you see this now as the possibility for joint solidarity between migrants and non-migrants emerging because they are both facing this problematic economic situation? Or do you rather think it will work, it will basically roll out into a, a competition, competitive situation between migrants and non-migrants in this con condition? I think it would be, it is actually very difficult for domestic workers to forge a sense of solidarity with non-domestic workers, uh, let alone uh, regular workers, you know, because of the specific nature of their work. But what is viable is to have, you know, solidarity among the domestic workers. And I was just talking to one of the domestic workers in Lebanon, and she perfectly understands the situation. She says, my employer has no income, so I don't expect him to pay me, but I'm still here. I have to, you know, live through this as they're living through it. She can see that their employers are facing hardship, and she is doing to she is trying to cultivate some vegetables and doing all sorts of extra work with in, in the neighborhood uh, to sustain herself. Um, and this is this is the point that I want to emphasize that the workers who come to work overseas are vulnerable, but they are also highly resilient. And I have seen their resilience, you know, during this crisis in, in Abu Dhabi. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for this. I would like to um, ask Jonathan Gay or invite him also to comment on this question of the changing labor market and different um, politics of migration. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, so far what is very obvious is that the pandemic is accelerating the digital transformation of work style. And uh, this is something which was already going on before the pandemic, but with the pandemic now it has, you know, it's on a whole different level. And uh, but then the second point about, you know, how this maybe would affect uh, or might affect mobility, I would be very careful not to read too much out of this, you know, and the point is that, first of all, we have to understand that the idea that migration is primarily driven by economy is just not true. You know, we've had this debate in, I don't know, in sociology, in migration studies for decades. The economy is not the number one driving force of migration. Of course, it is connected to other issues which put together, you know, might appear as econo an economic issue, but it's also very important that we separate them. But then secondly, uh, the idea that still related to the idea of uh, people migrating because of work, we also have to understand that most of the work, you know, migrants tend to create their own jobs. So if that is the case, then whether there is a decrease in, or the, uh, uh, whether the change of, uh, white collar job in terms of people being able to work from home, you know, has a result to uh, a lesser uh, interest in labor migrant does not mean that it will directly have a, an impact, you know, on population uh, movement or on migration because whatever reason that will uh, push people to migrate, I think they would always find a way to create uh, new work for themselves. Yeah. And then, uh, so basically, the point I would just like to make here is that, of course, in the heat of what is going on now, you know, one can be tempted to read too much out of all these things. Of course, things are going to change, things are already changing. And like uh, Professor Conke said earlier, the nature of work now is in such a way that I don't know, is hybrid and even multidimensional. People are working from home, but then they are also needed occasionally in the office. And they also work from Starbucks and other places. Yeah. So even to envision a picture or a scenario where there is a complete uh, uh, demise of the office. I don't even think that is possible because every now and then you would still need to meet people face to face. I mean, to deal with certain aspects of work. Yeah. And then, so I would just be a bit cautious about reading too much on this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I would like to add a, a short comment on this where, um, you know, this is now not based on research, but on the experience of teaching at the university where we also have students coming from um, Africa, for example, we have courses where we, we are supposed to, we are, you know, have African students. And here I have, uh, I have an experience that um, it has become quite difficult for students basically to get a visa to come now where you know a lot of courses are offered online and this can be can be a reason not to grant or you know to to prioritize a certain group basically over another and and that some of the students who normally under normal conditions would have gotten a visa to come here now are basically left out so we are still uh, we don't know how this thing will will um, look in the future but i agree totally with um Habib, that it's, it depends probably on the power to, to organize themselves and if their, their voice is heard, you know, of, of migrants. And so basically, if we thinking of that, I think us as scholars or as, as teachers might also have to help students to get their voices heard, to be able to migrate to the, the places where they want to study. This is just an add on also on this discussion. Um, I hand over to Amrita. Thank you, Professor Pelican. Um, 
I agree that uh, students may have to organize themselves to have their voices heard. Uh, having uh, said that, at the same time, uh, perhaps Professor uh, Honkar will agree that, uh, you know, in terms of migration diplomacy, uh, in terms of when not larger nation states are making decisions, uh, which affects individual lives at large, uh, how much that, uh, you know, that, that uh, space, uh, students, or uh, you know, regular uh, people from global south to global north migrating for jobs, for better livelihood. And I totally agree with Dr. Nge that migration is just not about economy. There are several other points of provocation for which people migrate, one of which is uh, better livelihood, freedom of expression. There are several reasons. There are different kinds of uh, migration profiles we have. Uh, so I would remain a little skeptic in terms of um, you know, like envisaging a future where uh, individuals and communities will have a substantial say in their opportunities of migration or not. Uh, with that, uh, let us uh, now open uh, the discussion uh, and let us now invite questions from the audience. We received one or two, we received a few in the chat box and uh, we now uh, invite the audience to pose their questions to our panelists. Well, while we are waiting, ah, yeah, there is already one person coming in. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, no, sorry, I was confused. While we are waiting, I might be able to read one of the questions that has been posted in the chat. So there is a question by Buwan Podel. Um, I have a question to all fellow panelists. Due to the various pushback measures at sea or on land borders against poor migrants, though they expect support and cooperation. Due to pandemic migrants, are more vulnerable due to the pandemic migrants are more vulnerable and facing most difficulties regardless of their status how could you forecast post pandemic migrants movement more restrictions for or flexibility would be there for people on move and this also uh, if i understand it correctly specifically refers also to undocumented migration maybe uh, one of the two panelists who are present would like to answer to this I just wanted to make a quick point about you know the irony of irony that the pandemic has created. So recently, I read that uh, many of the Maghreb migrants in Europe, especially Spain, because Spain was the epicenter of uh, COVID, you know, in, in infection, as you remember, uh, that at that point, uh, what was going on can be called reverse smuggling that migrants were actually paying smugglers to smuggle them back to their own country because they wanted to they wanted to run away from that kind of situation and they wanted to be with their family with their friends with their kids and kin uh, so that was happening so suddenly we see that some of the rich countries in the north were not doing that well in terms of dealing with the with the crisis and Africa for a long time, you know, didn't have a huge outbreak of, of, the, of COVID. Um, so initially that was an interesting uh, situation. So I'm not too sure. I mean, the whole situation becomes very uncertain what would happen. Uh, many people who have had a adverse experience would think twice before migrating. This look in my own country, I have access to this, I have access to that and I have the freedom of not following the rules. So, I mean, this is very interesting for Bangladeshi migrants, you know, because back in Bangladesh, they have the freedom to not to follow the orders of the government, which they don't have if they go to Singapore or in the Gulf. Thank you. I think we are coming to the final part of the session. We have to round up now because time has been elapsing. So um, we thank both panelists and also the audience for the questions and very much um, learned a lot from it. I think also in terms of methodology, I very much liked both presenters were, you know, talking about their own experience also as migrants. I think this is very important. It's part of particularly doing ethnographic research to be very close to our uh, interlocutors and, um, you know, living through the pandemic, living through the experience of being a migrant in within these times of the pandemic is definitely something which is helping us to better understand also the people we are working with and about. 
Um, we have learned a lot also about the two questions that we were raising about the vaccine rollout and have seen that this is rolling out in different ways in different locations, but also there are quite some shared experiences and that is very important, as um, was pointed out, both to understand better how the governments are managing, but also how the, the, the relevance of migrants being able to, to organize themselves and not to be left out, neither from the pandemic nor from future arrangements of work, and that also relates to the second part. So we very much like both the attempts of uh, Professor Conker and Do uh, Dr. Nge to not only you know, do research, but also be public scholars, basically to share their information with other scholars, but also with the general public to the benefit of migrants all over the world. And so um, we like to close this session here and um, thank you to the audience for being with us, for listening to us, and thank you to the organizers for allowing us to have this session. And thank you, Amrita, also for co organizing this session with me. And thank you for having us. I'm especially grateful to NICE to be in this nice atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's been a pleasure to have you all with us today. And uh, the discussion was absolutely so mind-blowing. It has actually left me spellbound. You covered on a lot of topics. And it was so, so, so nice uh, listening to it. It was one of the discussions that I actually enjoyed listening to. So thank you for being a part. And now I'd uh, like to hand over the session to Nimesh for the word of thanks. So uh, Nimesh, can we have the word of thanks? Nimesh? Yeah, of course, Bhakti. Yeah, sure. Just a second, ma'am. Distinguished Chair, Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, as we have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the Chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. A sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live. Thank you for your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much.